My name is Kathy Kiora. I come from New Zealand and I'm a food inspirer. I teach kids, I have to go back one, I teach kids how to eat a rainbow. That is the aubergine part of the rainbow, the broccoli and the cabbage in between. And I also teach kids how to cook a rainbow because I believe that it is one of the most important skills you can have. Food for me is more than survival. It is an act of care, an act of kindness and an act of love, not to mention an act of sharing. I grew up, and I can go to this slide now, and that's me, in the grasslands of New Zealand, in the North Island, in the Waikato, in Aotearoa, the land of the long white cloud. We had a big vegetable garden, an orchard, pecan trees, avocado trees, you name it. We had a menagerie, depending on my father's particular interest at the time. Peacocks, hens, chickens, ducks, geese, 100 cows, assorted different colours. And, of course, we had our pigs, pork and bacon. Um, so named, naturally, because we couldn't allow ourselves to become too fond, because strangely, pork and bacon would disappear each year, as would Lolly the lamb. So a lot of these animals made it to our table. And I like to think they had a really, really good life, because my father was a kindly farmer, and he looked after his animals. Um, we did not have a restaurant or a fast food joint for miles. <laughs> Hence, we cooked and we cooked and we cooked and we cooked some more. We sat down at a table. This wasn't us, they're way more glamorous than we were. We in fact had farm clothes on, but we did sit down at a table with a beige tablecloth, I think it was crocheted, and we had placemats, and we often had two courses because mum and dad were awfully fond of dessert. So we sat down at a table. And this is part of my speech because I believe we can change the world one plate at a time, sitting at a table. Simple, but not easy these days. So, actually, what put me on this whole path was doing a workshop for an NGO that I run, a little environmental NGO, and we were in my garden, lots of edible plants in my garden, and we were making with lots of kids a pot of edible flowers and parsley, sage, basil, etc. The kids love it. They love to grow and eat what they grow. And this little girl, she was a bright little eight-year-old girl, and she looked up at me and she said, Kathy, is that a real apple on your tree? <laughs> I was a little incredulous at this, but she wasn't joking. Did she think I got up on a ladder and put 150 James Greaves apples up on my tree one night with sellotape and blue tack? And I realised how far our urban kids are from their food. They are so far away. We don't educate them enough about food. Go. Right. Now... About the same time, I got the call that we all dread. The call that says, come home, your father's dying. And so I went on a plane back to the land of the long white cloud. But for me, it was a sad white cloud. And we sat around a table, the family and I, and we decided that Dad didn't have long for this world. And it would be my job, because we knew so little about his early life in Blueford, Illinois, in the United States, that it would be my job to talk to him about it and write down his story. And so I found myself looking down at a strong man who was dying. And beside him, on the table, was all the paraphernalia of death, all the medications, the painkillers, the morphine, but also... For Woody, there was a bright red ray of hope on a blue and white china plate, perhaps like a Delft plate. There was a slice of watermelon. 
And that is my dad's favourite food, was my dad's favourite food. And I had gone to lengths to procure it for him, because it was out of season in New Zealand. However, it lay untouched. A week ago, it would have been snapped up and delightedly eaten. But the cancer had Dad's appetite now. But I said, Dad, tell me about when you were a kid in Blueford. And his eyes opened, and I could see he was still with us, and he said, well, I'm going to do his accent, I'm sorry, Dad. Um, well, I remember Mom's hot biscuits. They were so damn good. Biscuits being scones. He said, my mum, she churned her own butter. And we kids, we picked the berries for the jam. And they were wonderful. And his lips were moving and his eyes closed. And I could see that he was back in 1920 in Blueford, Illinois, with his family sitting around the table in the old farm shack. Because food is more than just survival. It is memories, it is social history, it is our story. Dad would be horrified to know that in his country of origin, 20% of meals are consumed in the car. My father didn't stand on airs and graces, but he liked to sit around a table. He liked to commune and talk to people, and we did that every day he would be horrified. There's his favourite food, by the way. He discovered this, tiramisu. He said, I don't know what the hell that is, but I'm going to find out and I'm going to make it. And he did. Went back to New Zealand. You couldn't get mascarpone at the time. It was a while ago. And he remade it, and it was delightful. So, Dad and his tiramisu. <laughs> now, a little bit after my dad died, we went to visit Tim Smith's Eden Project in Cornwall. And his viewpoint is very, very important for my talk today because I saw him a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if any of you have been to the Eden Project. It is fabulous. Please, if you get a chance in your lifetime, go and visit his 74 million pound global garden. Absolutely superb. But Tim Smith said in June, he said, every big fat, hairy idea I have ever had, including this one, and it's a very big idea, have come to me around a table, sitting with people, communing with people, talking with friends, mentors, dissenters, strangers, family, all those ideas, because ideas blossom at tables. They really do. And there we go, now we're on to my mum. I got the next call. Come home, mum is dying. And unfortunately, this time, I didn't make it. So I didn't get to see my mum again. But we made her a fabulous funeral lunch. She would have loved it. We made her blue, caramel, blue cheese caramelised onion tart. We did date scones. We did pavlova with passion fruit. I hope I'm making you hungry because lunch is not yet. But anyway, it was fabulous. If only she could have come. And I managed to get through because somehow you do. You know, you feel a bit numb, but you get through these terrible days. And the next day, my friends arrived from all parts of New Zealand. And one of them brought me a cake tin. And I opened it, and all of a sudden, I was in floods of tears and emotion. Because inside the cake tin was my mother. I could smell her. It was Caramel Meringue Square. You can see it right there. It's her favourite, sometimes, food. Her favourite tart. It was beautiful. And my friend Briar had made it. Because food is more than just survival. It is love, and it is kindness. And my mum would be horrified to know that we celebrate our children's birthdays and celebrations with chicken nuggets and chips, over-processed, nutritionally poor food. She would be horrified because for her, a birthday was a celebratory feast and you served good, homemade, beautiful food and you sat around a table and it was wonderful. 
My mum, now, back to swimming here. Now, you know in the Netherlands we love our children, do we not? Yes, adore them. So what we do is we take them to swimming pools week after week after week, and they sit their swimming diplomas. This can last months, years, and <laughs> sometimes it's not that much fun for the mum or the dad at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning heading out the swimming pool, with a rather less than enthusiastic instructor going, Falkender, next, next, next. <laughs> And what? But we do it because we love them. We do it because we don't want our kids to drown, <laughs> right? Very simple. We don't want them to fall in that canal and drown. We do it because we nurture them and we love them. But at these facilities of nurturing, swimming pools, gyms, etc., where we nurture the temple of the body, what do we serve them? We serve them this. Now, I'm sorry, I'm not impressed. I'm absolutely not impressed. I really call upon all the sports facilities in the Netherlands and in other places in the world to start getting real food together and doing a bit better. And this, of course, is reflected everywhere. Hamburgers, chips, sodas served all over the world. Not nary a fresh thing in it. That is not food, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you agree with me when you taste my lunch that that is not food. I suggest... I suggest a simple little homemade lunch. It's not hard. I could teach the staff to do this in five minutes. I teach kids to cook every day. I'm sure I can teach a 19-year-old to put this together. So, next slide, please. And this, school fairs, hot dogs, etc. What about simply plates of fruit? What could be simply simpler than that? To my kids with raspberry love. Watermelon, melon, apples, oranges. So, so simple, so easy. Why do we need to serve hot dogs? Now, I have um, a little idea, and this is my food question. It's got, of course, this has been talked about before by many people around the world, Stephanie, Alexandra, Jamie, Oliver, etc. I'm going to add in one new inventive step. Table, very important. I will, I will take a coffee table or a picnic rug, okay, if you don't run to a table. Now, I'm going to add in the food, and the food must have providence. This is my new step. I want it to be good, honest food, and I would like people to know where it came from. That is my new step. I want us to think about what we're serving, both ourselves and our friends and our friends. Now, add into this human beings, very important at a table, preferably more than one if you can gather them. Nice to eat with other people. And this is the other thing. We used to do this, I used to do this at home, 20 whole minutes. Do you think we could sit at a table for 20 minutes? Would it be possible? No iPhones, no iPads, pods, Facebook, anything like that. 20 minutes without electronic devices. I bet we could do it, but it may not be easy. Easy. And I believe that will add to communication. And even if you've got the surliest teenager and you say to them, so, tell me about your high points, and they go, Ooh. and you say, well, tell me about your low points, and they go, Ooh. and if you've got a five-year-old who says, I'm not eating that, doesn't matter. They have to come to the table. They have to hear at least you communicate. It is so important. And really, the no electronic devices, please remove them, even music. I'm sorry, musicians. So that is my idea. And these are some of the people. I also say, make your food personalised. These are some of the wonderful people who have made your bread and helped put our lovely TEDx lunch together today. This is Esther at Backlust. She's made a gorgeous sourdough bread. This is Natasha, my favourite mushroom woman of all time, at the Organic Farmer's Market on Wednesday. She will tell you what to do with all of those creatures there. Things that I haven't heard of. This is Yvonne. She has given us the fruit out on the bowls today. And she grew these gooseberries and can tell you their provenance completely. It was a difficult year for gooseberries, apparently. <laughs> this is Jeroen, and he grew the lettuces that you'll be eating. These are people that we should all know. We need to get away from that impersonal way of eating. And often, you will find that these people will become friends. This is 
from Chef India and he's cooking his Taka Dal recipe, which only he knows. It is a closely guarded secret from his grandmother. These are wonderful people. We should get to know the people who bring us our food. Lastly, I want you to do me a favour. And the favour is this. When you have lunch today, I would ask that you would find someone you don't know. This is a dangerous thing, I know. Someone you did not come to, with the, to come to the conference with. Find a stranger and share your lunch with them. And I know it's a bit tricky, you know, that first conversational gambit, but this is my suggestion. Ask them about a favourite food memory. Ask them, and the conversation will flow, and you will find yourself with a new friend. Lastly, can I say, think about the many older people in the world. I'm fast becoming one myself. So many say that television is their closest friend. Invite people you don't know. Invite an elderly neighbour. Invite a friend of a friend of a friend. Share food. Do this for me, and I think we will make our world a better place. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>